Până tinerii bisericii ajung la locurile lor pentru a slăbi pe Domnul, doresc să salutăm în numele bisericii noastre familia Hanciu din Melbourne, am înțeles că sunt oaspeți noștri în dimineața aceasta, veniți de la Melbourne cu ocazia graduării lui Mihai, fiul lor care a terminat facultatea de medicină aici în Western Australia. Dacă nu cer prea mult, vă rog să vă ridicați, să vă vedem unde sunteți familia Hanciu. Domnul să vă binecuvinteze, frate John, felicitări întregii familii, întregii uh, case băiatului dumneavoastră, care sperăm să lăsați la perț să lucreze ca medic. Dumnezeu să-l binecuvinteze, n-am auzit amin din partea familiei Hanciu. Ok, cântă tinerii bisericii, apoi ascultăm mesajul Evangheliei pe care fratele uh, John Gilmore îl va aduce bisericii noastre în dimineața aceasta.
Good morning, everyone. Well, that took me by surprise. I was waiting for the baptisms, and then I thought I was going to speak. But uh, thank you uh, to your pastor, Benjamin. He's always so kind to me and the way he describes me. And um, I had a bit of difficulty with the headphones, but I, I think he was making a comparison between me being a federal court judge and God, who's the judge of all. That's extremely kind, but I, I come this morning um, not as a judge, but as a brother in Christ. Uh, I come as a follower of Jesus. I have this very strong sense that at the foot of the cross where Jesus was crucified, that the ground is level. And uh, those of us who have come to faith in Christ, we stand on level ground. The Lord doesn't look at us and love us because of the job we have. He loves us because he loves us and we love him. And, uh, and so we're all one in him, accepted in the beloved. This is a great thrill for Marcy and myself to be here this morning. I've been so excited at the prospect of seeing 17 young people um, express outwardly what has happened inwardly in their, in their hearts, namely that they have come to faith in Jesus Christ. I, I actually don't know any of them, I don't think. I, I don't know what their journeys have been to this point where they're prepared to publicly proclaim Christ as Lord. Some of them may have been very far from him. Some of them may have followed the ways of this world. Some of them may have thought that life was better outside of Christ. But the relentless shepherd has obviously pursued them and brought them back into the fold. And that is a wonderful thing. Let me pray before uh, I bring God's word. Father, I thank you for this special day, this day of... Um, the baptisms of 17 young people. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the one who came to fetch us out of this dark world and bring us into the kingdom of light, into the kingdom of your dear son. We thank you for the Holy Spirit who dwells in those who believe. The same spirit who raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And I pray, Father, that this morning you would raise us all from the dead. That you would enliven us and encourage us and strengthen us, challenge us and convict us by your word, which is sharp and living like a two-edged sword. We love you, Lord. And we thank you that you're Emmanuel, God with us. In Jesus' name, amen. So the, um, the message this morning is one that uh, I received from the Lord when I was um, kayaking on the River Swan near where we live. And um, I was praying about the young people who were going to be baptized today and I asked the Lord for a message specially for them. It's actually a message for all of us, but it is a message especially for you who are being baptized this morning. And the message came really like a flood. I was only out on the water for about 40 minutes, but in that 40 minutes, the Lord gave me um, this message for you. So um, that's how special uh, you are to him. You've heard of 2020 vision. That speaks of the sharpness of the vision of our eyes at 20 feet. And 2020 is um, a very acute, uh, sharp vision. The message I want to bring you this morning is what I've called 10-10 vision. That doesn't mean you have half the amount of vision. It's because the scripture the Lord gave me on the river is from John chapter 10 and verse 10. And uh, in the second part of that scripture, which many of us will know, probably most of us will know, uh, it says that Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, that he came that we may have life and that we may have life 
abundantly or life to the full. So often in scripture, when there is good news, it is often accompanied by bad news. And uh, in this one verse, we see the bad news and the good news. Because the beginning of the verse says that the thief, speaking of Satan, the thief comes to uh, steal and to kill and to destroy. But I, Jesus Christ, have come that you may have life and life abundantly. In that one verse of scripture, in a sense, you see the gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ because it speaks of the struggle between evil and good, the struggle between Satan and Christ, the struggle for the hearts of men and women and young people, between the ways of this world and the ways of Satan and the ways of God, the ways of Christ. And this morning, these 17 young people have turned to Christ to give their lives to him and to say they want to follow him from here on. Now, as young people, you're at the, the beginning of your life. Um, uh, I'm closer to the end of my life. Um, well, certainly closer than you are. So your whole lives stretch out in front of you. You live in this great country of Australia, and it is still a great country. I came from another country to this country. Many of you came from Romania to this country. It is a wonderful, wonderful country to live. We have freedoms that are unheard of in other countries. We have stable government. We have um, a justice system that is free from corruption. We are free to worship Jesus Christ and our Father in heaven. In many nations of the world, that is not the case. But in our nation, it is the case. But we should not think that this will always continue because the forces that are reigned against Christianity and Christians are growing. And so as young people, I don't know what the Australia is going to look like in 30 years' time. But I tell you this, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. He is... He is the Lamb of God, but he is also the King. And he reigns in heaven. The victory has been won. The question is, will we walk in his victory? The question is whether we will live in this great nation just for ourselves. The question is, will you live just an ordinary life? The life that many people want to live all about the job you'll get, the husband or the wife you'll have, the, the home you'll build, the children you have, all things good in themselves. But if that is all that you're living for, then you will not have an abundant life. You'll have an ordinary life. And Jesus came that you may not only have a new life in him, but an abundant life life, a life overflowing, filled with his spirit, and making a difference in this world that he's placed you in. I didn't become a Christian until I was 30, and, and, and regrettably, I, I used to think that Christianity was boring. And maybe that's because some of the people who call themselves Christians I found to be boring. You know, becoming a Christian, being born again, is not, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that as you go into the years that follow, that you will be a vibrant person. You will be if you follow the Lord, if you allow him to guide you and lead you in all of life. But if you're kind of partly Christian and mainly in the world, well, you, you won't give off the perfume of Christ. 
and you'll be kind of not one thing or the other. And you may seem boring to other people, and maybe even you will be bored, but the real Christian life is an exciting life. It's not a boring life. We owe it to the Lord, we owe it to our brothers and sisters, we owe it to people who don't yet know him, to seek the Lord so that our lives are full and abundant and attractive, that people look at us and say, even not, if not to us directly, but to say to themselves, what is it about you? What is it about that young woman? What is it about that young man? That he doesn't do the things that we do, and yet he seems happy. He's not always wanting to go off and get drunk. They're not always wanting to go down and party and go to the nightclubs. And yet they're not boring people. There's something attractive about them. And the attractive thing about you is the person of Jesus Christ in you by his spirit. The lure of this world is so, so strong. I, when I was growing up, I, I didn't know anyone that took drugs. I knew some people that smoked marijuana. That's when I was at university. But drugs are a scourge in our society. Getting hold of young people, destroying their lives, the work of the enemy who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But as young Christians, we, we, you need to, to live a very different life. And you can only live that life when you're close to the Lord. This is not the rest of your life today. This is the first day in the rest of your life. And each day will be a new day. And each day is a day that you need to look to the Lord for everything in the day that he has given you. Before I became a Christian, I um, was very ambitious in my profession. And really, like most people, I think, um, I lived for myself, and even when I got married and had children, we lived for ourselves. Uh, now, wanting to um, succeed in your profession or your work or your trade, whatever the, you have, to have a good marriage, to look after your children, that, that's not wrong in itself. But if that's all your life amounts to, then you're never going to have an abundant life. You're never going to be fully satisfied. Now why is that? It's because whether, whether people believe it or not, God made us for relationship. For relationship firstly with him and then in the strength that we have in him to have relationship with other people. And when we try and escape relationships and fill them with other things, then we become inward, self-centered, selfish people and our life is no longer abundant. A friend of ours says that a man or a woman wrapped up in themselves makes a very small package. An abundant life is one that spills over into the lives of other people touches lives, changes lives, makes a difference in the power of God. And you know, the strange thing is that the, those people who seek to preserve their lives and, and huddle behind their homes and their flat TV screens and their overseas holidays and the fancy cars and, and the money in the bank and that's what makes them happy are actually usually not very happy people. The amazing thing is that those who look to God, who, who prepare to share their time and their money and their heart with people and who, who spend their lives on behalf of other people are amongst the happiest people on the earth because that's how God made us. Because that's how God is. God is a giving God. He loved the world so much that he gave his only son. Now, I just want to take a sidestep here from the, the message that I'm giving. It does actually come back to the message, but 
it's a bit of a, a, a side alley. And forgive me if, if uh, there's anyone here who, who does the thing that I'm going to say you shouldn't do. You don't have to do it, uh, what I say. I'm just going to suggest something. It's about the use of words. I find that in our culture, words that have great meaning in the scripture have become diminished. Their value has been reduced by modern culture. Um, for example, the most obvious word that has diminished in value is the word love. So on the one hand, we say we love God. On the other hand, we say we love coffee. Now, do we love God the same way we love coffee? Do we love coffee the same way we love God? We think we know what we mean, but actually it's a, it is a reduction in the value of the word. But that's not the word I want to talk about. The word I want to talk about is the word awesome. Now, since I've been thinking about this, I'm amazed at the number of people who use the word awesome. It's an awesome day. Um, I loved the coffee, it was awesome. Uh, I heard a song on the radio yesterday, it was awesome. Um, my girlfriend's awesome, my past is awesome, my job is awesome. It's so used that it's actually become meaningless. Now, the secular dictionary describes the word awesome in this way. Inspiring an overwhelming feeling of reverence or admiration or fear produced by something sublime. Inspiring an overwhelming feeling of reverence. Is that how you think about a song or coffee? You know, in the Bible, the word awesome is used often, but it's only ever used to describe two things. The first is to describe God. Our God is an awesome God. And the second thing is to describe the things that God does and has done. The deeds of God are awesome. So, if you'll forgive me, I, I'm encouraging us as Christians never to use the word awesome unless we're describing God. Because that is who he is. Nothing else and no one else is awesome. Because you see, when we understand how awesome God is, when we understand the extravagance of his love, we un when we understand how amazing is his grace towards us who did not deserve his grace, if we will understand how much he longs for relationship with us, then why on earth would any one of us settle for anyone else? When we have the creator of the entire universe looking down upon us, looking into our hearts, looking into our eyes, knowing our name, saying it's written on the palm of his hands, that he came for you, he longs for a relationship with you. Why would you settle for anything less? When you can walk day by day by day with the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You see, this speaks of intimacy. You see, some people, uh, you know, they, they love the church. They talk about they love the church. They love the church's services. The church we go to, um, um, we have a very different kind of service. I actually think your services are great. I think our services are great in a different way. Um, but some people really like the, the form and the way things are done, and that, and that becomes their focus. And in a sense, they, they forget actually that they've come to worship God. It's not about your building or your, 
your worship team or the pastor. It's, it's you as individual people and Jesus Christ, the lover of your soul, who longs for an intimate relationship, heart to heart, that will carry you not just through a church service, but through every day of the week, through good times and through difficult times. Psalm 91.1 says that he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. It speaks of a, a dwelling place. Psalm 27 also says that I may dwell uh, with the Lord every day of my life. Psalm 23 says to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's not a visiting, it's not a coming occasionally on, for example, on a Sunday to meet God, but dwelling with him every day and throughout the day. But he's speaking of a close heart relationship. Paul the Apostle, at the very end of his life, after everything he had been through, shipwrecks, beatings, stonings, near death, uh, the most amazing life lived for God, all the miracles that he'd seen. And at the very end of his life, he said, I want to know Christ. Friends, I know Christ more than I did last year and the year before, but I want to know him more. And that's my encouragement to you as young people, not to be satisfied with what you, you know now, but to seek after him. Seek after him in his, in his word. Um, you know, in our family, one of the, as our children were growing up, one of the scriptures that we memorized and our children memorized was from the Proverbs. How can a young man, how can a young person keep their way pure? by living according to your word. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. If you want to know what's right and wrong, don't listen to the latest news bulletin or what, what people down uh, in your work are saying or on Q&A on TV. See what God has to say because he has something to say about everything because he is the author and perfecter of life and faith. So an abundant life will be a life of purpose. You'll have a heart for God, a heart for people, a heart for service. Serving your wife, serving your husband, serving your children, serving in the church, serving in your community, in the places you work. A giving, outpouring life. And a giving, outpouring life will be a life that the, that the Lord by his spirit will continue to fill. A selfish inward looking life will just become like dirty water. We want the river of life flowing through us and into the lives of other people. That is an abundant life. You know, my father is uh, aged 102 and he lives in Scotland and uh, sometimes when I mention that to people they say, oh, isn't that wonderful? Um, that's awesome. Um, uh, and you've come from good genes. Um, we, you know, you might live to that age too. And, you know, sometimes I say it, sometimes I don't. But when I do say it, I say, you know, I've got no desire to live to 100. If I do, fine, by the grace of God. Because it's not how long I live that matters. It's how I live that matters. Jesus Christ was 33 when he went to the cross. I'm nearly twice that age. It is not the quantity of our years, it is the quality of our years. And he is the one, and he is the only one. I, I am utterly convinced, utterly, absolutely convinced he is the only one who has the power to make a real difference in my life and through my life and the life of other people. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Let me leave you with this because living a, an abundant life, some Christians can be kind of entirely victorious. You know, the, I, I, I hear people that get on the platform and, 
And they talk about how their, their lives have just been one long, victorious life. And they always have shiny white teeth and the hairs, all the hairs in place and they don't wear glasses and, um, and they're young and vibrant. And, and it seems like nothing ever goes wrong in their life. And you know what? I don't actually believe them because Jesus said, in this life you will have trouble. In this life, as a follower of Jesus, you will have difficulties. If he had difficulties, you can expect difficulties. And the question is, how will we live an abundant life when things are tough? Because things, there's, there's not a, there is not a mother or a father in this church building today who would disagree with me when I say life can be very difficult. There's a, an amazing account in the book of um, First Kings. Israel had just defeated the Syrians in a battle that took place in the mountainous regions of Israel. And um, this is First Kings chapter 20 and, and at verse 22. So the, they had just won this great victory up in the mountains. And then we, we come to this place where there is a discussion between the prophet of Israel and the king of Israel, and then it switches over to the king of Syria and, and his army commanders speaking to the Syrian king. So in 22, after this great victory in the mountains, the, it says the prophet came near to the king of Israel and said to him, come strengthen yourself and consider well what you have to do, for in the spring the king of Syria will come up against you saying, like, you may have won this battle, but the Syrians will come back. And then going over to the Syrian camp, it says, the servants of the king of Syria said to him, the gods of Israel are gods of the hills or gods of the mountains, and that's why they were stronger than us. That's why we lost the battle. But let us fight against them in the plain or in the valley, and surely we shall be stronger than they. So these Syrians were saying the only reason we lost the battle was because it was in the mountains and the God of Israel is the God of the mountains. You know, we talk about mountaintop experiences when we can see a long distance, everything's going really well. We're feeling victorious. We seem to be winning battles. You know, we're doing well in our fa with our marriage, with our job. Um, everything seems great. But then there are times when we're no longer in the mountains. We don't have that. 2020 vision, but you can still have 1010 vision. Because God came to give us an abundant life even in the valleys of life. So it says in verse 28 that spring came, um, and the, a man of God came to the king of Israel and said, Thus says the Lord. Because the Syrians have said, the Lord is a God of the hills, but he is not a God of the valleys, therefore I will give all this great multitude into your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. And what happened was that there was a battle, and this battle took place in the valleys. And it says that the, the armies of Israel were like two little goats, and the armies of Syria were a multitude that covered the valleys. And that day in that battle, 130,000 Syrians approximately lost their lives and Israel was victorious. And they were victorious because the Lord was showing to the Syrians that he is not only Lord of the mountains, he is Lord of the valleys. And it's the same in our lives. I remember going through a, a time in our lives when I just couldn't see any distance at all in terms of how my life was going. So many things were going wrong. It was difficult beyond my ability to comprehend or even live with. I was actually in great anguish. So I went to my wife, because you, you, know, you should discuss these things with your marriage partner. And, and the, uh, I guess I was looking for sympathy well, I didn't get sympathy. Uh, I got quite a good lesson, really, because Marcy said to me, 
you know, in the valleys, that's where all the, the, um, the manure comes down off the hills and, and it's damp and uh, it may not be a lot of sunlight, but in that place, that's where you can really grow. You know, it's a good soil. And you can always come out of the valleys and up into the mountains again. I want to say to you young people that in the days of difficulty, do not despair for the Lord is always with you. He is the Lord of the mountains, of course, but he is also Lord of the valleys. And I have to say in my life of 34 years nearly of following Jesus, I've loved the mountaintop experiences. Um, they've been thrilling. But the times when I've really grown in Christ, the times that my character has been challenged and by the grace of God, as I have um, surrendered areas of my life to him, um, having been challenged, my character was changed. You see, this relentless shepherd of your souls accepts you as you are, but he relentlessly wants to make you more like his son. That is his, that is his heavenly aim, that you will become more and more and more like Jesus and be his ambassadors in this sin-filled, dark world. Jesus said, he who is the light of the world said to you and me, you are the light of the world. So my prayer for you is that you will go into the world and shine. Shine for Christ with his light. Um, that you'll be salt that will add flavor to the lives of people. That your life will not be dull or boring or routine or ordinary or mundane, but that you will live an adventurous life that doesn't always mean knowing what's going to happen. Usually it means not knowing what's going to happen. Not constantly worrying about your bank account. We all worry about money at times. But realizing that with God, life can be an adventure. And as you do that, as you live that kind of life, that surrendered life to Christ, the one who loved you even unto death, the one who reigns in heaven, the one who's coming back again, your life will be abundant and you can be people who transform the world that you live in. In Jesus' name, amen.